Last week, India celebrated 76 years of independence. But many in our country are still looking for independence from caste prejudice and discrimination. Today at The Wire, we are being joined by Manoj Mitta. He is a former journalist and now a writer. He has written two books and he comes to us with his third book, which is called Caste Pride, Battles for Equality in Hindu India. I would say that this is essential reading for anybody who wishes to understand um, India's trajectory with caste and how the battle for legal equality has played out from colonial times till now. This book is vast, it's extensive, but I would urge our readers to read it because it is essential to our understanding of the legal history along with the political history of where India is today in terms of caste. Thank you so much, Manoj, for joining us at The Wire. Thanks, Ravasti, and for your generous introduction. Uh, so my first question to you, as the uh, book suggests, it's the battles for equality in Hindu India. And it kind of traverses India's legal and political history for over 200 years. Now, you have written two books in the past. One was on the Sikh riots, one was on uh, the Gujarat riots in 2002. What made you choose caste as the topic of your third book? As you said, I dealt with uh, two uh, egregious instances of mass violence. And um, what I was originally planning to do was to complete a trilogy on mass violence. This time I wanted to focus on uh, mass violence targeting Dalits. And I wanted to explore this question. Why is there so much impunity for uh, such instances of mass violence, despite uh, a special law? You know, unlike in the case of uh, communal violence, where there is no special enactment, uh, in the case of uh, uh, violence or atrocities committed against uh, um, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, there is a law, and a law that is supposed to be rather stringent and in the eyes of some even draconian. And so my question was, why is there so much impunity for it? And um, I, when I looked at uh, some of those instances, uh, you know, examined the judgments and uh, looked at uh, the prosecution documents and so on and so forth, I was struck by the fact that again and again I'm coming up uh, uh, with, I mean, I'm confronted by uh, this pattern of uh, some arm or the other of uh, the Indian state betraying um, caste prejudice. Uh, I mean, there was no other way of uh, interpreting it given the kind of uh, specious grounds on which, uh, uh, you know, instances of uh, such magnitude, you know, crimes of such uh, magnitude were resulted in, um, you know, acquittals. Uh, so, it was, it would be, it could be the police that, uh, you know, did these, uh, did the cause of justice in or it could be uh, the prosecution or in some instances the, uh, the trial court or it could even be uh, the tr appellate court. So I was trying to understand where was this uh, kind of institutional bias or structural bias coming from and that um, made me go into earlier debates beginning with say uh, the debate in the constituent assembly over the abolition of uh, untouchability. And then there were references to uh, what happened uh, during the colonial period. Because after all, what was happening in the Constituent Assembly was a legacy of uh, those unfinished battles. So one thing led to another and I found myself uh, unearthing a whole lot of uh, uh, hitherto unseen material from um, uh, legislatures and uh, courts going uh, all the way back uh, to early 19th century. So it's over 200 years yeah. and so, different aspects of caste reforms and they were most revealing. Hmm. Revealing not just about, uh, uh, you know, the situation in India at, at that time of the colonial rule, but also it uh, helps you understand uh, many of today's uh, fault lines. Yeah. So that was the spirit in which I expanded the ambit of my book from uh, uh, merely focusing on violence to uh, you know, where this uh, prejudice was coming from. Right. So, you spoke about how, uh, in the book, you talk about how caste has informed legal punishments and legal reforms throughout colonial history until now. So, you in the book, you talk about how the British, in their bid to win over the upper caste, uh, who were essentially the men in power, they gave penal provisions an Indian twist. Uh, 
Now, two things stood out to me in this regard. One was the punishment of confinement to the stocks and the other was the exemption of the Banaras Brahmins from the death penalty. If you could talk to us a little bit about these penalties and how the British gave it a gave it an Indian twist, as you call it. Yeah. So, before I go into the details of that, one needs to uh, put that in context. We are now talking about that early phase of colonial rule. After all, this phase, the colonial rule is said to have begun after the Battle of Plassey in uh, 1757, right? So we are talking about early decades. And uh, this was a time when they were trying to understand our society, our culture, our religion, and they began to do these uh, translations and so on, right? So I, it was then uh, the, their understanding that uh, uh, given the fact that they were in one huge country and they were so few in number. So one way they thought they could uh, run the country, control these masses was through the elite, by co-opting the elite. So the first thing they did was that in 1795, they came up with this, uh, I mean, among other measures, uh, it took the form of this uh, enactment, this law. In a departure from their above principle of equality, they exempt uh, uh, Brahmins and among Brahmins particularly Banaras Brahmins because they were considered the most sacrosanct, Banaras being the holiest of holy cities. So they exempt Banaras Brahmins from death penalty irrespective of what crime they were found to have committed. This is in keeping with uh, this notion, this traditional notion that uh, Brahmins uh, cannot be killed for any reason whatsoever because that would amount to Brahmahatya, for which there is no uh, you know, remedy. Mm. So, so even somebody like uh, Lord Ram was not exempted. When he killed Ravan, Ravan was supposed to be a Brahmin, while Ram was uh, merely a Kshatriya, which is a rung lower than Brahmins. So they uh, very um, willfully, very astutely, they decide to, uh, or astutely in courts, uh, they decide to... Uh, incorporate that in their uh, uh, system of uh, law uh, and administration. But thankfully, it didn't take long, uh, about two decades later uh, or so, they uh, realize their folly and uh, do away with it. They repeal that law. Okay. You know, this is, uh, um, while, you know, shortly after uh, this, uh, or around the time this enactment relating to, um, you know, exempting Brahmins from death penalty is repealed. Um, somebody in uh, this happens in uh, Calcutta, Bengal presidency, hmm. the law relating to Brahmins. Now, uh, in uh, Madras presidency, uh, somebody who goes on to become governor of Madras, Thomas Munro, when he was in charge of uh, uh, drafting laws for that uh, presidency, he comes up with this idea of uh, co opting something from uh, the Western uh, tradition, which is uh, this very corporal, very barbaric form of punishment called uh, confinement in stocks. Uh, you know, this is, there are references to it in uh, Bible, uh, in uh, uh, Shakespeare's literature. And in fact, that is the origin of that uh, famous term, um, laughing stock, right. you know. So this is about, uh, you know, a convicted person uh, being uh, subjected to ridicule uh, is put in a public place and uh, his feet would be clamped to a wooden frame with holes. So, and uh, he would be, you know, uh, flung with uh, all sorts of things, uh, spat upon and stuff like that. So, it's a very dehumanizing uh, punishment. And that was uh, typically reserved for uh, the underclass for in uh, the West, hmm. you know, the labor that was uh, errant and, uh, uh, you know, that had to be punished. So this was how they dealt with it. And uh, Munro very perversely thought, okay, why don't I bring that here into the Indian uh, milieu and uh, use it against uh, lower caste. Hmm. So we have, uh, this is the first uh, instance indeed of... Uh, this expression lower caste was uh, actually put in uh, a law. You know, this is uh, 
Right. Yeah. So uh, the book also provides very insight, uh, interesting insight into the intersectionality of caste and patriarchy. In in various ways, we see not only uh, women from the lower caste; they are obviously worse off because of their caste, but they get the absolute end of the stick because they are also women. An example of this, which was very interesting, was about um, the women in Travancore who were not allowed to cover their breasts in public. So if you could tell us about this incident and how this. came about yeah this was actually a bizarre fallout of uh, uh, queen victoria's proclamation of uh, 1858 uh, this was uh, in turn uh, uh, a sequel to the great revolt of 1857 and as you know it also marked uh, the transition from uh, east india company to india being uh, directly ruled by the british crown so at that time during that period of transition she made this proclamation and uh, reaffirmed uh, the british commitment to um, you know being very mindful of uh, people's religious feelings and uh, she undertakes that you know there would be no attempt to interfere with them because after all if you recall the 1857 revolt was triggered by this perception that uh, um, you know there was some uh, fat made uh, drawn from a uh, cartridge you which know, offended the uh, hindus yeah, and the muslims yeah, for different yeah. reasons yeah fat you you know it, uh, there was this perception that it was either from uh, pigs or from cows cows yeah. so so my mindful as they were of uh, that uh, backdrop they made that reaffirmation again and that in when it was translated into malayalam in travancore which was a princely state they uh, interpreted that to mean that okay since they are not going to interfere with our uh, customs uh, they took it as a license to bring back uh, certain uh, practices which were already uh, repealed uh, due to efforts made by some um, reformers and uh, because of intervention by uh, the british administration you know mm. so uh, so we had this uh, very curious and instructive situation where um you know the dominant caste that was nayars uh, in collusion with uh, the diwan uh, madhavrao who was a, a brahmin Ma- marathi speaking brahmin from uh, travan uh, from uh, tanjore yeah. in madras presidency and uh, the king of uh, travancore they all came together and decided okay since there is such a demand being made by the dominant caste uh, we will not let um, uh, women of uh, a lower caste namely nadar who were showing signs of uh, you know uh, some uh, equality assertions of equality because they had been exposed to education they were uh, they were also a influence of christian missionaries many of them had converted and uh, they had taken to entrepreneurship but because of the stigma of uh, their caste being associated traditionally with uh, toddy tapping they were looked down upon and uh, one must also bear in mind that in uh, the south including travancore it was not just untouchability uh, what was practiced there was also unapproachability so they came up with this uh, diabolical uh, device uh, a proclamation uh, as a, i mean t- drawing inspiration from uh, uh, very erroneously uh, of course from um, uh, victoria's proclamation uh, saying that uh, 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 women of uh, nadar community will not be allowed to cover their breasts why because if they uh, were uh, if they were allowed to do so then they would be indistinguishable from women from upper caste and uh, for them it was important to know you know uh, you know from a distance you need to know whether Uh, those people were from this caste or that caste because there were very strict rules about how much distance uh, each caste had to maintain from the caste that was above it and it was all very instructive to see how caste was so uh, such a non negotiable such an overriding concern for uh, us uh, i mean this is irrespective of uh, the colonial rule and if anything colonial rule was not uh, the villain of the piece here yeah it was our own uh, you know obscurantist uh, notions which we were 
uh, carrying forward. And these are not things that uh, the British were introducing in our heads. It's something that we had and we were negotiating. Those of us who were in those dominant positions were negotiating with the British to, in order to perpetuate them. Mm. But then beyond a point, they could not tolerate that because there was a, a pushback from lower caste, from the affected caste. And uh, they tried to be fair and uh, they intervened uh, in a manner that... Uh, alleviated the situation to an extent. Yeah. yeah. So, as you have been mentioning about this and as we are still on the topic of intersectionality of caste and patriarchy, another case in point that illustrates this further, as you were mentioning earlier, was the fight to abolish Sati. So, uh, here we find, as you were saying, that um, an unlikely villain in the, in the book, we find out that the unlikely villain is Mr. Motilal Nehru, who was found to be defending Sati in the interests of the upper castes. Yeah. If you could tell us a little bit about this. But what was his backstory? What, was, what did he do when he was not yet such a big leader? When he was a prominent uh, uh, member of the bar in uh, Allahabad High Court, he takes up a case in which uh, some uh, four or five uh, uh, persons were already convicted uh, in a case of Sati, um, uh, rejecting their plea that, uh, you know, they were not to blame because uh, the pyre uh, lit on its own. Right. Uh, a spontaneous combustion took place. Hmm. Why? Because of the sheer piety of uh, the woman who was uh, committing Sati. Hmm. This was the plea they took in their defense. And that was rejected outright by the trial court. Now, Motilal Nehru takes up... Uh, this case at the appeal stage and re reiterates that line of uh, argument, that line of defense. The fight back from Indians, uh, Indian politicians against caste only happened when some sort of political representation happened for Indians and they started um, finding themselves in legislatures uh, following the uh, reforms that took place around that, that time. How did this change happen and how did Indians finally start bringing bills to change the caste hierarchy and the system of discrimination uh, through legal reforms? See, uh, Indian representation began, uh, you know, way back in... Um, 1861. Um, this was after all the changes that took place uh, post uh, the revolt and post uh, the entry of the crown, where the crown was directly ruling us, right? But then in those early decades, the few Indians who were there in those legislatures were essentially um, big uh, uh, landlords, zamindars, big rulers themselves. So they were not um, uh, likely to have any truck with uh, issues concerning social reform or anything of that sort. They were very deeply um, uh, orthodox in their approach. Uh, but things got better as they were made uh, more and more uh, constitutional reforms. And, um, you know, by the turn of century, you had people like, say, um, uh, say somebody who was considered uh, Gandhi's and... Uh, um, uh, Jinnah's uh, mentor, that is Gokhale, hmm. you know, uh, entering people like Gokhale, you know, people who had uh, uh, their uh, background in Congress uh, discussions and all uh, meetings. So they uh, were members of this and that uh, did increase uh, the quality of uh, discussions and interventions. Yet, um, uh, you know, not until 1916 was the issue of uh, something as egregious as untouchability um, not taken up uh, in that uh, house. Um, it, and when it was, uh, when the silence on untouchability was finally broken, it was uh, not because of uh, uh, any of the prominent uh, leaders with uh, Congress background. It was somebody uh, who was very little known and who was not even a Hindu. Uh, his his uh, name was uh, Manakji Dadabhai, hmm. not to be mistaken with uh, Dadabhai Naraji. Yeah. In 20s, at a time when, because of the non-cooperation call made by uh, Gandhi in 1920, uh, Congress was actually, had actually boycotted these uh, uh, legislative bodies. And uh, in subsequent years, a breakaway group of Congress in the form of Swaraj Party did participate. And uh, it was... Uh, in order to uh, 
fill that void that uh, you know justice party you know came in in a big way and they came into power in uh, madras and they initiated certain reforms you know they were the ones who uh, came up with this uh, measure of affirmative action for the first time in british india in 20s so this is how things unfolded yeah so you were mentioning earlier about how the um, congress did not really uh, had it was a big tent the congress was a big tent as you mentioned and there were all kinds of leaders um, so we had a madan mohan malviya we also had a vittal bhai patel so we had various kinds of leaders from the congress and you have written about and also you mentioned earlier about how political reforms found uh, precedence over social reforms yeah. for the congress so this is very interesting if you could tell us a little bit how the role of the congress evolved from the 20s onwards where earlier as you mentioned that dada bhai nawro ji had said very clearly in the 1800s that that congress will not be talking about social reforms at this point and let's just focus on the political agenda yeah. but later 20s onwards the things started to change within the congress itself and the fight yeah. started focusing on that as well so if you could tell us about the evolving role of the congress from the 20s onwards so this is a struggle that preceded uh, colonial rule and it also survived uh, the end of the colonial rule mm. you know the decolonization of india and it is still there with us whereas colonial rule ended uh, as you said at the beginning in 1947 we celebrated the 76th anniversary of that right mm. so whereas there is no such anniversary of the end of uh, uh, the social struggles because those struggles never ended mm. and congress took a long while to realize that um there was a lot of tussle going on in congress uh, there were these battles that were being fought in congress and outside uh, in the larger indian society during the colonial rule on this issue of caste and they were not necessarily between upper caste and lower caste they were between two sets of hindus the progressive uh, you know liberal hindus on one side and these um, orthodox obscurantist hindus on the other side who would uh, um, not hesitate uh, citing all sorts of uh, reasons uh, uh, relating to custom or even religion they would quote scriptures to defend uh, the most uh, untenable uh, practices that were in force i mean for the kind of arguments say um, somebody like uh, malviya gave uh, for opposing uh, um intercaste marriage uh, bill initiated by uh, vithal bhai patel so likewise you would see somebody like gandhi also taking very long to understand uh, um you know to for his own understanding to evolve in throughout 1920s you know he, in, by 1920 he had in a sense captured congress party he became the unchallenged leader of that party mm-hmm. right so through those 20s he was also a votary of uh, varna system although formally he had right in the 1920 nagpur congress resolutions um was instrumental in uh, uh, you know making a, a resolution against untouchability but then it does not translate into anything radical like okay we will now throw open uh, all these uh, Uh, public amenities hmm. to dalits we will now throw open uh, temples you know that was considered even more challenging even more sensitive uh, issue so it he it was not until uh, say 1932 you know the uh, puna pact hmm. uh, in which uh, 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 depressed classes i mean most importantly somebody like um, uh, ambedkar was forced to uh, give up uh, their hard fought uh, right to a separate electorate right so when uh, uh, as a result of that puna pact uh, he i mean gandhi felt the need to make a reciprocal gesture so there were certain resolutions that were for, passed by his followers in bombay just a day after the puna pact huh. and uh, one of them related to uh, temple entry and uh, bit by bit as his own understanding got better uh, he opens up to the idea of uh, uh dalits who were then called uh, depressed classes he began around that time referring to them as harijans yeah uh, so he he opened up to that but even then it was in a very very incremental manner hmm. he it was not uh, in the sense in which ambedkar uh, 
you know, in 1929, Ambedkar had uh, drafted a, a bill which which uh, adopted a rights-based approach, which meant that uh, across the board, in all temples, all Hindus, irrespective of caste, and in most uh, certainly including uh, Avarnas, untouchables, uh, they would be given access to temples. In 1929. Ambedkar took that position, yeah. and in 1933, when this, uh, when Gandhi's uh, eyes opened to the need to, you know, deal with the uh, uh, temple entry issue, he does not, uh, uh, you know, adopt uh, Ambedkar's uh, rights-based approach. What he adopts is what he called local option approach, which is that um, you go and uh, conduct a referendum in. Uh, in a given temple, I mean, it's you take it up on a case by case basis. Um, so there's no question of suddenly overnight all temples being opened up. Most certainly not those ones which have a long history, you know, which are considered very sacrosanct. So he said, no, if there is some temple somewhere which wants to open up, so you conduct a referendum among the local devotees, and if they are in favor of it, that temple and that temple alone will be opened. Mm-hmm. And likewise, you conduct a referendum in another one. So he actually uh, backs a, a bill that was introduced uh, at that time uh, by one Ranga Iyer um, in the central legislature. So those are the kind of uh, efforts being made, you know, through those thirties. It was very half-hearted. It was not uh, something which said no, uh, untouchables or whoever was considered untouchable cannot be. Uh, stopped from entering uh, temples because they are as much uh, Hindus as uh, uh, Brahmins. No, he did not. He was not willing to go that far. Mm. He was uh, meaning to do it in a very incremental manner. As a mass leader, his uh, compulsion was to be not too far ahead of uh, the public opinion. You mm. know, in his own personal life, he was quite uh, radical. Mm. You know, in his own uh, ashram, he would not, uh, uh, you know, follow any. Uh, these varna rules yeah. he would himself participate in uh, uh, the task of cleaning toilets and so on and so forth he would adopt a, a dalit girl as his daughter and so on right yeah. but uh, in his public uh, persona he was different he was forced to be very cautious appear very conservative so that he did not appear too reckless or too radical so this is dichotomy you see in gandhi um, so this is all very uh, Fascinating to discover. This yeah. dichotomy in Gandhi, which you have referred to in the book as Gandhi's balancing act, yeah. as um, basically in his bid to woo people's hearts, he did not want to take any radical steps. But a very contrasting approach was taken by Ambedkar and any uh, discussion on India's fight uh, against caste obviously cannot be complete without discussing Ambedkar. So you have written about how the two uh, had a couple of differences about approaching the issue of uh, whether it was temple entry or um, or how uh, depressed classes would get representation. If you could uh, tell us how these differences kind of play out and what were their uh, positions on which yeah. they while uh, Ambedkar was seen more of a radical in that sense Gandhi was more of a moderate so if you could explain that a little bit see uh, they had their own um, trajectories their own uh, learning curves so to say in uh, during 20s um, Ambedkar was not uh, anywhere as radical as he was in 30s you know he was uh, quite keen on exploring the possibility of finding finding an honorable, dignified place for um, uh, um, uh, Dalits within the Hindu fold. Mm. So he uh, one such uh, step was, uh, as I said, the 29 uh, uh, bill that he drafts. And then he, the following year, he himself leads uh, a temple entry movement in uh, Kalaram Temple in Nasik. And that proved to be uh, quite a turning point for him because he sees uh, the vehemence with which uh, Hindus, uh, conservative Hindus, uh, push back against it, and uh, there was even violence. And that was not the first time he was seeing. You know, in 1927, he had a similar experience that was in Mahar uh, with respect to throwing open uh, a, a lake, uh, a tank as it was called, Ch- Chavdar Le- a tank, uh, to Dalits. So there again, there was uh, violence and so on, and um, he 
you know uh, on that occasion does go to the extent of uh, uh, even um, burning pages from uh, manusmriti right as a mark of protest uh, but then since that is not quite considered uh, uh, a religious scripture like say bhagavad gita is uh, you know it did not still mean that he had given up on uh, hinduism uh, as his subsequent actions showed he even participated in uh, uh, an event in which uh, he experimented with the idea of uh, uh, making dalits wear uh, genuine sacred thread mm. so these were the kind of things he was doing in 20s right and that culminated in that uh, uh, temple entry uh, movement in uh, 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 nasik and uh, the reaction he faced the opposition he faced uh, disenchanted him it went on for uh, for quite some time but uh, uh, you know while he was negotiating with gandhi on uh, uh, you know representation in uh, whether it should be separate electorate or joint electorate and stuff like that you know he had um, first encountered gandhi in uh, the second round table conference and then that led to the uh, mcdonald award in which uh, dalits were given uh, uh, separate electorate and then that led to this uh, puna pact in which he gives up uh, that right so gandhi then uh, among the things he tries to do is uh, um, as i said uh, deal with the question of temple entry but by then ambedkar had moved on mm. he was not interested in uh, temple entry anymore because of his experience at uh, nasik he was now more focused on capitalizing on uh, uh, what came out of uh, the pune pact which is that okay there will be no separate electorate but there will be uh, reservations in the form of uh, you know elector uh, constituencies that are reserved for them and uh, he was happy with uh, the fact that uh, there were many more than he originally had in mind uh, that were reserved for uh, um, scheduled castes Uh, they were not the term was yet to come into yeah. force that came into force only under the 35 act so now these are the uh, kind of uh, uh, trajectories that they were going through yeah. and uh, in the beginning uh, he was very happy with uh, the fact that uh, okay gandhi gave into um, this issue of uh, uh, the reserve, reserved constituencies because what happened was in the round table conference gandhi was opposed to not just separate electorate but he said no question of even reserved constituency uh, you leave it to the goodwill of uh, hindus they will take good care of uh, untouchables so that was a position that he had taken in the round table conference and gan ambedkar given his own lived experience of how you know there was opposition to any kind of reform at every step he said no that can't be left to the goodwill of uh, upper caste hindus so you have to have something that is codified some uh, concession has to be made so then finally it came out in the form of the spuna pact in which okay there was a half measure uh, uh, they met halfway mm. you know uh, ambedkar gives up on his separate electorate and then gandhi concedes on this uh, uh, separate uh, on this reserved seats right which is a system that we still have mm. right the origins are in the spuna pact and uh, in the initial phase uh, as i said ambedkar had his own learning curve he was very excited he thought okay he uh, pulled off a great uh, coup but then it didn't take long for him to realize that uh, uh, these reserved uh, constituencies would mean that only those uh, dalits who were acceptable to um, the majority of uh, the electorate which is caste hindus mm. they would get elected it's not as if a radical dalit would be uh, readily embraced by um, you know caste hindus who constitute uh, the majority of the electorate right mm-hmm. so he realized that he, he and he was very disenchanted with that so by the time uh, constitution making began the kind of positions he had begun to take in mid 40s was okay we have to get back to separate electorate mm-hmm. so he uh, he was so um, disenchanted by then with this experiment with uh, reserved constituencies but then he goes on to uh, become the law minister of the country and then become the chairman of the drafting committee mm. so he all those uh, positions uh, moderate his uh, pos- his uh, own uh, opinion on those aspects 
um, finally what we have is what uh, was initiated what was initiated by the pune pact that is reserved constituencies and then uh, it was also extended to reservations uh, in um, educational institutions and uh, jobs and so on but as you mentioned that um, what ambedkar had um, what he was struggled to uh, struggling to get in terms of legal reforms pre independence somewhat something he did manage to get post independence because of the positions that he held at, as the chairperson of the drafting committee of the indian constitution but finally for post independence india did make laws to end uh, untouchability and kind of bring an end to caste discrimination and you know, finally in 1989 we had the prevention of atrocities against sc sts but in the book you mention even after that there have been so many instances of mass violence in a sense against dalits um whether it was in the 1960s in kevanmani or in batnitola the kind of atrocities that have continued despite laws coming in specific laws coming in to end injustice um ki- kinds of brings into question the whole legal struggle that has gone on for the past 200 over 200 years so in your opinion where has independent india gone wrong and where do we go from here great question because if you only look at what is there in the statute book you won't get a sense of where this uh, uh, deeply ingrained prejudice was coming from on the other hand if you look at the legal history that preceded this enactment mm. right you will then get a sense of why there is still so much impunity that uh, the kind of violence that uh, we saw post independence was something that um, gandhi in his lifetime did not see mm. violence targeting dalits mm. uh, even ambedkar did not see ambedkar passed away in 56 and for that matter even nehru who passed away in 64 did not see because the first such instance of mass violence targeting dalits that took place in uh, kilvenmani as you said mm. in 1968 mm. and uh, that set uh, the template not for, not only for violence for mass violence you know it was an instance in which uh, uh, some 42 um, women and children belonging to the dalit community were burnt alive yeah hmm? and they were all found in one room hmm. you know all packed into one small room in a hut hmm. Hmm? but there was no proper investigation no questions uh, uh, were answered by any of those judgments or as to why so many of them were packed into one room who forced them into that one room why they couldn't escape mm. who was stopping them from escaping nothing none of that on the contrary what you see is uh, madras high court acquits all the ones who were convicted by the trial court and goes on to make some very classist statements that you know it's hard to believe this was the kind of sensitivity or the lack of it that india was displaying in the 70s mm. you know it said you know it's hard to believe that people who are so well off who have own cars would uh, be part you know party to such violence or would be part of those mobs right yeah. but then you know this is the kind of tendency this is the kind of mindset uh, that india displayed uh, and that is what led to more and more such instances of violence so because of the template that uh, kilvan mani set not only for violence but also uh, for uh impunity hmm. you know courts the way they uh, let off these killers right so that's what led finally to uh, the more stringent law the 1989 law and hmm. that came during uh, Ra- rajiv gandhi's last year hmm. in power and um, well but it again showed that no matter how much you um, reform the law how much you tighten the law it's a step forward for sure but when it comes to enforcement um there are so many loopholes uh, that uh, people find and ultimately uh, very there's very little by way of justice and to understand that you need to go into this history because history shows the legal history of these caste reforms shows that um, many of these things that were done around the time of independence or post independence were all done uh, out of sheer expediency there was no change of heart there was no remorse hmm. 
on on that note thank you so much for joining us very uh, interesting point that you have ended with that the battles for equality were not just between the upper caste and lower caste but it was also within the upper caste within sections of progressive sections of moderate sections of certain people who were more radical than the others for all this and more please do uh, read this book if you want to gain more insight into how legal reforms uh, were conducted in india and how we have come to where we are today and um, and why the impunity against um, caste injustice continues till this day thank you so much for joining us on the wire thank you shrasti thank you ravi mehra thank you the wire ke aur videos dekhne ke liye subscribe kare aur bell icon par click kare swatantra patrakarita ki aarthik madad karne ke liye description mein diye gaye link par jaye aur apni rashi chune